Hi, my name is Lynn McTaggart. Welcome to my podcast, Living the New Science. In these first podcasts, I'm covering some extraordinary discoveries by frontier scientists and why this changes everything we think about how our world works and also how we should live our lives. Today, I'm going to talk about new research which suggests that water may be an information superhighway and a tape recorder of molecular signaling. Many scientists debunk the idea of homeopathy because it doesn't seem to conform to the natural laws of science. If solutions with active substances are diluted to the point where there's virtually none of the original substance left, as they are with homeopathy, the only way such a medicine could work, so the argument goes, is if there's both a special quality to the water and an ability by molecules to leave behind essential information as a memory. Now, increasingly, scientists believe that both these requirements may be true. In all aspects of life, molecules must speak to each other. When you're excited, your adrenals pump out more adrenaline, which tells specific receptors to get your heart beating faster. The usual theory, called the quantitative structure-activity relationship, QSAR, is that two molecules that match each other structurally exchange specific chemical information, an energy transfer that happens when they bump into each other. It's rather like a key finding its own keyhole, which is why this theory is often also called the key keyhole or lock and key interaction model. Biologists still adhere to the mechanistic notions of Descartes that there can only be reaction through contact involving some sort of impulsive force. Although they accept gravity, the scientists reject any other notions of action at a distance. If these contacts are due to chance, there's very little statistical hope of their happening considering the universe of the cell. In the average cell, which contains one molecule of protein for every 10,000 molecules of water, the proteins jostle around in the cell like a handful of tennis balls floating about in a swimming pool. The central problem with the current theory is that it's too dependent upon chance and also requires a good deal of time waiting for that collision to occur. It can't begin to account for the speed of biological processes triggered by anger, joy, sadness, or fear. The late French biologist Jacques Benveniste carried out countless studies decisively demonstrating that cells don't rely on the happenstance of collision, but on electromagnetic wave signaling at low frequencies, less than 20 kilohertz. The electromagnetic frequencies that Benveniste studied correspond to the audio range, even though they don't emit noise that we can hear. According to Benveniste's theory, two molecules can be attuned to each other even over long distances and so resonate at the same frequency. These two resonating molecules then create another frequency that in turn resonates with the next molecule or group of molecules in the next stage of the biological reaction. This would explain, in Benveniste's view, why tiny changes in a molecule, the switching of a peptide, say, can have a radical effect on what that molecule actually does. This idea is not so far-fetched, considering what we already know about how molecules vibrate. Both specific molecules and intermolecular bonds emit specific frequencies, which can be detected billions of light years away by the most sensitive of modern telescopes. Yet although such frequencies have long been accepted by physicists, 
few have paused to consider whether they actually have some purpose. Although other scientists have conducted extensive experimentation on electromagnetic frequencies in living things, Benveniste's contribution was to show that molecules and atoms have their own unique frequencies by using modern technology to record those frequencies and then using the recordings to accomplish cellular communication. In extensive tests, Carried out in the early 1990s, Benveniste demonstrated that he could transfer specific molecular signals simply by using an amplifier and electromagnetic coils. Over thousands of experiments, Benveniste recorded the activity of the molecule on a computer and replayed the recording to a biological system sensitive to that molecule. In every instance, the biological system was fooled into thinking it was interacting with the molecule itself and acted accordingly, initiating a biological chain reaction just as it would have in the presence of the actual molecule. In 1992, the Federation of American Societies for Experimental Biology held a symposium organized by the International Society for Bioelectricity to examine the interactions of electromagnetic fields in biological systems. And many scientists have endorsed and successfully repeated tests using digitized information for molecular communication. Professor Madeleine Ennis of Queen's University in Belfast joined a large pan-European research team with hopes of showing once and for all that homeopathy and water memory were utter nonsense. One of Benveniste's other areas of experimentation was also finding that water could record this electromagnetic information as well in high dilution experiments. So Ennis and her other research team wanted to demonstrate with four independent laboratories in Italy, France, Belgium, and Holland that Benveniste's original experiments were nonsense. The experiment was impeccable. None of the researchers knew which was the homeopathic solution and which one was pure water. All the solutions had even been prepared by labs that had nothing further to do with the trial. The results were coded, decoded, and tabulated by an independent researcher who also had no connection to the study. In the end, three of the four labs found statistically significant results with the homeopathic preparations. Professor Ennis still didn't believe these results and put them down to human error. To eliminate the possible vagaries of humans, she applied an automated counting protocol to the figures she had. Yet even the automated results arrived at the same conclusion. High dilutions of the active ingredient worked regardless of whether the active ingredient was actually present or the water was so diluted that none of the original substance apparently remained. Ennis was forced to concede, the results compel me to suspend my disbelief and to start searching for rational explanations for our findings. So what's the role of water in all of this? The most common substance on the planet, which also contains the world's second most common molecules after hydrogen, water continues to bedevil scientists, even those working with it every day in the laboratory. This seemingly simple molecular structure, two atoms of hydrogen for every one atom of oxygen, belies its singularity. Water is a chemical anarchist that behaves like no other liquid in nature, displaying no fewer than 72 physical, material, and thermodynamic anomalies, with many more apparently still to be unmasked. 
Water is among the most mysterious of substances because it's a compound formed from two gases, yet it is liquid at normal temperatures and pressures. It's the lightest of gases and far denser as a liquid than as a solid. Hot water behaves differently than cold water. It freezes faster than cold water does. And ice density increases as you heat it up, but shrinks on melting. Water has an unusually high melting point and boiling point. The list of bad behavior goes dizzyingly on. Water is most of what we're made of. Humans are about 70% water, plants 90%. There are 100 times more molecules of water inside us than all the other molecules put together. Water covers three quarters of the planet, and life on Earth is impossible without it. But we are still no closer to understanding exactly how it behaves. Attempts to model water continue to fail. You could spend your entire career, and many scientists do, playing around with water and feel like you're getting nowhere. Two late Italian physicists at the, at the Milan National Institute of Nuclear Research, the late Giuliano Preparata and his colleague Emilio de Giudice, demonstrated mathematically that when closely packed together, Atoms and molecules exhibit collective behaviors and form what they termed coherent domains. They were particularly interested in this phenomenon as observed in water and published a paper demonstrating that water molecules create coherent domains much as a laser does. Light is normally composed of photons of many different wavelengths, like colors in a rainbow. But photons in a laser have a high degree of what's called coherence, rather like a giant single wave of just one intense color. As Del Giudice and Preparata theorized, and other scientists went on to investigate, single wavelengths of water molecules appear to become informed in the presence of other molecules, that is, they tend to polarize around any charged molecule, storing and carrying its frequency so it can be read at a distance. This suggests that water can act like a tape recorder, retaining and carrying information whether the original molecule is still there or not. So vital may water be to the transmission of energy and information that Ben Veniste's own studies actually demonstrated that molecular signals cannot be transmitted in the body unless it's done through the medium of water. And that rigorous shaking, called succession of the containers, as is done in homeopathy, may serve to speed up the process. In Japan, a physicist named Kunio Yasue of the Research Institute for Informatics and Science, Notre Dame Sheishin University in Okayama, Japan, also found that water molecules have the ability to organize discordant energy into coherent photons, a process known as superradiance. Benveniste found that water seems to memorize the unique signature frequencies of molecules. In his studies, when water was exposed to a chemical, then diluted to the point that none of the original molecules remained, the water sample could still be used in place of the chemical to trigger a reaction. In one study, Benveniste took a test tube of blood plasma and added water exposed to the sound of heparin, an anticoagulant drug that prevents blood from clotting, transmitted via its digitized signature electromagnetic frequency. This signature frequency worked as though the molecules of heparin itself were there. In its presence, blood was more reluctant than usual to coagulate. This means that water, as the natural medium of all cells, may be acting as the essential carrier of a molecule's signature frequency in all biological processes, 
and that water molecules organize themselves into a pattern on which wave information can be imprinted. Water appears to not only send the signal, but also amplify it. More recently, another group of Italian scientists from Sapienza University of Rome and the Second University of Naples carried out three years of research that confirmed Preparata's and Del Giudice's findings that certain electronic resonance signals can create permanent changes in the physiochemical properties of water. Benveniste's radical ideas are also being vindicated by the work of French scientists and Nobel laureate Luc Montagné, co-discoverer of the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. Montagné recently discovered that water also broadcasts information. His team carried out an ingenious series of experiments involving two test tubes, one containing a tiny piece of DNA from a sample of bacteria highly diluted in water and the other containing only water, and both surrounded by a weak 7 hertz electromagnetic field. When they checked the second test tube 18 hours later, it too had evidence of the DNA in the first test tube as though information had been beamed from the first and teleported to the second. It had also occurred over many hours and not seconds, and in an ordinary room temperature, not temperatures approaching absolute zero that are usually required with a quantum process. Interestingly, the first sample of water had to be diluted many times, as occurs with homeopathy, in order for the experiment to work. The scientific community did not know what to make of Montagne's little experiment, and many dismissed it, claiming that the great co-discoverer of the AIDS virus had gone off the rails. Nonetheless, his little experiment carries huge implications, and not just that a big visible substance like water operates according to quantum effects. The late Rustam Roy, a professor of Penn State University, once argued that these kinds of properties definitely demolish the objection against homeopathy when such is based on the wholly incorrect claim that since there is no difference in composition between a remedy and the pure water used, there can be no differences at all between them. Or, as Montagne said, high dilutions of something are not nothing. They are water structures which mimic the original molecules. If he and his colleagues are correct, the fact that water can serve as an information highway for all living things is extraordinarily significant when you consider that water is the basic component of life. Think of the implications. Can we imprint information into the water we drink to affect ourselves? Is water, in effect, tape recording our thoughts? When someone holds a focused thought, is he altering the water in the cells of the object of his intention? These are all really good questions to play around with at home. Just try sending an intention into some food, which is made up of a lot of water, and try a positive one and a negative one and see what happens. This is Lynn McTaggart, helping you to live the new science. Keep listening and I'll continue to give you information and tips each time about how to incorporate this new information into your life.